Welcome to another study in the book of Isaiah. I'll ask, if you will, to please be turning to Isaiah chapter 28, as we're going to move on to a new section uh, in the book of Isaiah. It's divided up into various books, if you will, or you've got collections of books that uh, comprise a section. We just got through looking at chapters 24 through 27. And we saw those songs of praise. We saw those aspects of that section. And now we're moving into another one of these sections. And this is, again, a very dark picture being drawn. This is called the Book of Woes. And this will take us from chapter 28 through chapter 33 with an interlude there in chapter, uh, chapter 32. So let's, let's, let's take a look briefly at what we're going to be talking about here in this Book of Woes. Uh, as it relates to a, a difficult message that Isaiah is to deliver in this situation. First, you've, first of all, or the first woe has to do with Ephraim, or Ephraim is going to be addressed. He's talking specifically to the leaders of Judah here, and that's in chapter 28. It's probably going to take us a couple of sessions to get through that chapter. There's 29 verses in this chapter, and there are, are, are some key points that we really want to nail down. Uh, as we look and see what the basis of that war was. The second war was against Jerusalem, and it had to do with their hypocrisy. That's in chapter 29, verses 1 through 14. The third war is against those who hide from God. That's in chapter 29, verses 15 through 24. The fourth war was against the rebellious, and that's uh, referenced in chapter 30. You've got a woe regarding those with a worldly trust. That's in chapter 31. Then we find this interlude. We find a, a, a prophetic message that's included there. But he pauses this series of six woes at this point to discuss the glorious future and the prediction of that glorious future. And that's going to be seen in the entirety of chapter 32. And then we'll close out this section in chapter 33, and that's going to be a woe to the destroyer. And that's probably a reference to Sennacherib. We're going to put the context of these six woes in the time of Hezekiah, as most commentators seem to agree that that is the reference that is made historically here. Now remember, as we look at our historical setting, our historical background, we have a date of 722 BC for the captivity of the ten northern tribes of Israel at the hands of Assyria. We're going to see Sennacherib being a key player there. We're going to see Sargon II historically being a key player. And we're looking at the fact that Israel was carried away into Babylonian captivity because of the idolatry from which they would not repent, despite numerous prophets being sent to them. At this time, and we've already referenced this here in this book, Judah is going to turn more and more to earthly alliances. They're going to put their trust in worldly kingdoms to help deliver them from this onslaught, in spite of the fact that God had promised to care for them. We go all the way back to chapter 7 and look at Ahaz in regard to that and the, uh, al the alliance that he sought there. Well, chapters 28 through 33 is basically going to be a retelling of the same later. We're going to see the same problem occurring, but it's going to be occurring uh, in the time frame, basically, of Hezekiah. Now, he ruled from about 715 to about 695. He did much good. Uh, we see a reform effort that, that uh, he was motivated to do. Uh, where he tried to wipe out all the aspects of the idolatry that was seen. Later on, it's not going to be as good. He's going to make some foolish decisions and is going to have to suffer the consequences of those. But here we have six woes that are pronounced as it relates to Judah's relationship with both Israel and Assyria. Judah's sins and weaknesses are going to be addressed in these difficult passages that we're looking at. So now we're ready to move into chapter 28, and we're looking at this first woe. The woe is to Ephraim, 
as well as the leaders of Judah. So first of all, we see Ephraim being referenced, and this is going to be in verses 1 through 6 of chapter 28, God and the punishment of Ephraim. Woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower, which is at the head of the verdant valleys, to those who are overcome with wine. Behold, the Lord has a mighty and strong one, like a tempest of hail and, and a destroying storm, like a flood of mighty waters overflowing, who will bring them down to the earth with his hand. The crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim, will be trampled underfoot, and in the glorious beauty it is a fading flower, which is at the head of the verdant valley, like the first fruit before the summer, which an observer sees, he eats it up while it is still in his hand. In that day the Lord of hosts will be for a crown of glory and a diadem of beauty to the remnant of his people, for a spirit of justice to him who sits in judgment, and for strength to those who turn back the battle at the gate. There in verses 1 through 4, we in essence see a rebuke of Ephraim, and specifically to the leaders there of Ephraim. Now when we think about leaders, we think about physical leaders, and we think about the kings, and that is part of it. But we also need to address the priests, the spiritual leaders of the day, and what they should have been doing at this time. In spite of having physical leaders and spite of having spiritual leaders, Ephraim, Israel, Ephraim is stated, all of Israel, all ten tribes being addressed. Ephraim was a larger of the tribes and may have been seen as the most influential. But in spite of all that they had in place, they still were led to a place that's going to result in their being taken down, losing their national identity, and being carried away into Assyrian captivity. So here we see a portrayal of them. Why was it that they were carried away? What resulted in their being carried away into Assyrian captivity? Here we're going to see this rebuke. These verses again focus on the punishment of those ten northern tribes known as Israel. This introduces the rest of the woes that we're going to be seeing in this section of chapter 28 through chapter 33, as we've already indicated. So when you look there at verse 1, this word woe summarizes the sad sound of disaster. It's a burden, and then it's referred to as a burden in other places. The burden of Isaiah was telling of these woes. It was a difficult task that he had to do. Nobody likes to bring bad news. Nobody enjoys telling people what their fate is because of their lack of faith, yet it needed to be done. And here we're seeing an example portrayed of Ephraim that Judah needed to sit up and take note of. Now, we know, as we've already moved through some of this, that Judah is not going to pay any attention to that example. And sometime, Beginning in 606 B.C., a little over a hundred years, one generation, maybe two, we're going to see the repeat of this punishment. It's going to be in the form of Babylon, with Judah being taken away in three ways into Babylonian captivity. Here Isaiah recalls this message of doom. You see, Ephraim had already been doomed. There had already been a burden spoken against them, but now it's setting up for the next that's going to be seen. In other words, here is Judah that, that, that is being addressed, and they're being called to remember what's been said about Ephraim, about Israel at that point. Now, this was prior to their fall that this burden was said. Now, their fall again is 722 B.C., and if you're making notes, you might jot down Isaiah chapter 7, verse 8, Isaiah chapter 17, verse 3, where we've already addressed that concept. This is nothing new, should have been nothing new to any of these people. Isaiah has already addressed it. Now, the, the metaphor of a drunkard here 
We're not talking about literal alcoholics. Now, they may have had problem with alcohol, but that's not what's being addressed here. There's a characteristic of the drunkard that is being portrayed, and that is the confused, stumbling, bumbling aspect that is accredited here to the leaders of Ephraim. They're just wandering around. They're confused. They're stumbling around. They don't have their wits about them. And we're going to see that result in Assyrian captivity because of that lack of leadership in the last years of Judah's, of, excuse me, of Israel's existence. We see this characteristic of these leaders. In verses two through four, we see God through Isaiah speaking of those who are going to come and take down Ephraim as, as a violent storm. We see something relentless being spoken of. We see no compassion. We see no mercy. We're looking at pagans who are going to come in and take them down. As it related to Assyria, it was not a religious thing. This wasn't... Uh, God was going to use Assyria and their bloodthirstiness and their desire for more. He's going to use that to punish his people because of the spiritual shortcomings of their leaders at that point. Interestingly here, Ephraim is compared to the first ripe fig, and Assyria is going to see them that way. People were anticipating that first ripe fig, that first sweet piece of fruit. It was prized for its delicious flavor, and it was eagerly eaten by those. And so here again, you see uh, some sense of a metaphor that's being portrayed here. Israel is seen in the capacity, the hunger, the anticipation, the desire for that first fruit. They're, they're, they're ripe. They're ready for the taking, and they're going to be consumed. Now, even in the midst of this, in verses 5 and 6 of chapter 28, we see a message of hope. I find it fascinating as we look at the book of Isaiah. That's a very common approach that Isaiah, through the Holy Spirit, took in his revelation. It wasn't just bad. Every once in a while, you still see a, a ray of hope that's portrayed there, and I believe, again, we're looking at something that was indeed intentional. We're looking at something that was intended to let them see that even in this time, there's something else coming in the future. Israel carried away into Assyrian captivity. Judah, here, as we see this address, is going to be carried away into captivity. That's the woe that's coming against them, the punishment that's going to fall on them. But through all of this, I still believe we see this concept of the remnant and saying it's not going to be over. It's not going to be total. It's not going to be complete. We're looking at something that has to occur, and then God's going to get back to work through the remnant to continue those precious promises that we find throughout the Old Testament that's going to culminate in the fulfillment of the seed promise as given to Abraham and others. The false beauty and the glory that's portrayed in verse 1 is going to be portrayed or replaced by a true beauty and a glory that I believe is going to be seen in the person of the remnant and in that context. The Lord promised to provide judges with the proper attitude. And again, he promised to be with them in battle. It was a promise that he had never abrogated. From the time that Joshua was given the promise that they could go in and take the land, and as long as they were faithful, that God would fight for them. That was a promise that should have been heeded throughout, yet they didn't trust in that promise. We know that because they saw alliances with these physical kingdoms. And something is going to happen. You're going to see this punishment. And when they come back out of captivity, we're going to see to some extent that belief in that promise, that faith in the presence of God and caring for them is going to return in the form of that remnant. It's going to be seen as a beautiful way. Well, now in verses 7 through 13, we see now that we're going to, we're going to see the, the religious leaders of Judah 
who are addressed here. Let's read verses 7 through 13. But they also have erred through wine and through intoxicating drink or out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through intoxicating drink. They are swallowed up by wine. They are out of the way through intoxicating drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. For all tables are full of vomit and filth. No place is clean. Whom will he teach knowledge? And whom will he make to understand the message? Those just weaned from milk? Those just drawn from the breasts? For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue, he will speak to this people, to whom he said, This is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing. Yet they would not hear. But the word of the Lord was to them. Precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and caught. Again here, just as Ephraim was referenced in this capacity, now Judah is portrayed in the same way. The leaders are portrayed as being drunks, as being alcoholics, drunkards is the word that is used. Now again, I do not believe that this is referring to a literal drunkenness. I'm not saying that they didn't abuse that. I'm not saying that they did not partake in alcohol. What I'm saying here is there is some semblance of the drunkard that is being portrayed here. And remember, it's the confusion, it's the chaos, it's the stumbling, it's the bumbling. It's an inept leadership. That is what is being portrayed. You're looking at those who are impaired by the alcohol. Here we're looking at leaders who are impaired by something else. They are not leading the people as they should be leading the people. These were the very men who have been given the responsibility of divine guidance for the nation. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18. Leviticus chapter 10, verse 11 speaks of the responsibility that is on the leaders to lead them in the way to lead the people in the way that God would have them to go. That was not the case. Hosea refers to priests who were not doing their job and because of that God's people were destroyed for lack of knowledge. And so God was going to reject those priests who had fallen down on their responsibility to properly lead God's people. Verse 8, very sickening language being used here. And, and, and it's intended to be. This is drawing a picture of something repugnant as it relates to Judah as the reason for the woe that is brought against them and as a reason for the punishment that is going to come if they choose not to repent and turn back to God. Here, the, the, the horrible picture is drawn of a table that's filled with vomit. And it shows the vile character that led to their lack of spiritual perception. They were, they were sickening people. It's hard to watch somebody throw up without getting sick ourselves. And here it's hard to not get sick ourselves when we look at the, the, the character and the qualities, or the lack of character, the ineptness of the leadership of Judah at that point. Then we look in verses 9 through 13 of the leaders who were rejecting the prophet. We might have asked that question, who were they rejecting? Whose leadership were they rejecting at this point? It's Isaiah. They're not going to listen to Isaiah. Isaiah is going to be sent to them to try to get them to repent, or he is sent to them to try to get them to repent. Jeremiah was sent to them to try to get them to repent. And we can go right on down through the minor prophets and see the same thing in those pre-exilic prophets that we see among those 12 minor prophets. They were rejecting Isaiah. They rejected Jeremiah. They rejected others. How do we know they rejected them? 
because beginning in 606 BC, they were carried away into Babylonian captivity. The very punishment that Ephraim, Israel, received is going to be mirrored as it relates to what happens to Judah at this point in time. The leaders and the people had refused knowledge. Now, notice an interesting picture drawn here. When the adults refuse the message, must God turn to the children, hoping they will hear? Was it too late? Did God look to greener pastures? Those are interesting questions that we might investigate a little deeper at another time. But that seems to be the picture drawn here. You're looking at people who are stubborn. You're looking at people who not only don't want knowledge, they're rejecting the knowledge of God. And to reject the knowledge of God, to reject the will of God, is to reject God himself. It's to say, no, I want to follow something else. I want to go my way. And we see so many passages showing where that never worked out. Judges 21, 25, Jeremiah 10, 23, Proverbs 14, 12. And that list can go on and on and on when you're looking at the problems that man has gotten into when he sought to try to establish his own way. But here we need to see, and it's an important message, to establish our own way is to reject God's way. Many people today seem to approach God as if it were the buffet a golden corral. You walk down through the line, you say, I want a little of that, I want a little of that, I want a little of that. No, I don't want any of that. Oftentimes when I went in the golden corral, I didn't want anything green. I wanted everything brown. I'm a carnivore and I wanted the meat, but I rejected, I chose not to take what was available in the form of the vegetables. When you look at this situation, you're looking at these leaders who were taking a little, but they were also leaving or rejecting something else. Isaiah could very well have been referring to, to those of Assyria, that foreign tongue that was spoken of. Later on, Paul is going to quote this passage, and it's going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, an entire chapter on the use of tongues. But he's going to quote this passage in verse 21 of 1 Corinthians 14. And basically what he says is unintelligible speech, no matter how impressive it might sound, is of no lasting value as it relates to mature thinking. Judah's refusal to listen, to heed the words of Isaiah, we're going to see a tragic conclusion there. A failure to heed God's message had long been at the root, though, of man's problems. Deuteronomy 8, chapter 20, Joshua chapter 5, verse 6, 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verse 19, among many others. Again, I'll challenge you to jot those down and to go back and look at those contexts and see that a pattern has been established for some time. Nothing is new that Isaiah is dealing with. We're looking at flaws that man has had for hundreds of years as it relates to those situations. Now, we're going to see the political leaders addressed, and we're going to at least start on this. It's chapter uh, 28, verses 14 through 22. And what this is, is we're going to see this section that ends with a call to these scoffers to heed God's word. A contrast is provided here between the false hope that these leaders are trying to establish. What's their false hope? It's a hope that these earthly nations, worldly nations, physical nations are going to provide. They're going to help us. They're going to help us fight our battles. They're going to help deliver us. That's a false hope that is being contrasted with the true security that only comes through a genuine use application of God's word. So here we find the injunction, first of all, verses 14 and 15, to hear the word of the Lord. 
Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scornful men, who rule this people who are in Jerusalem. Because you have said, we have made a covenant with death, and with Sheol, we are in agreement. When the overflowing scourge passes through, it will not come to us, for we have made lies our refuge, and understand fault, and under falsehood, we have hidden ourselves. Bottom line, Isaiah was urging them to pay attention to God's word. You see, it had been delivered. Promises had been made. Parameters had been established as it related to the covenant that God had entered with them. God's part was he was going to care for them. God's part was that he was going to give them instruction and guidance. Their part was to listen to apply what God's word had said and to put their trust in it rather than in the, the physical that they would be able to touch or see. You see, it's a faith that God was trying to build that they lacked at this point. Why did they turn to these pagan nations and alliances? Egypt is going to be addressed here, has already been addressed as well. And there's others. Why turn to them? Because they don't have faith. They needed something tangible. They needed something physical. Remember Thomas, when Christ had been risen, you're looking at that 40 days, he, he, he wanted to, to put his hand in the holes in, this, in, in Jesus' hands, and he wanted to put his hand in the gash in Jesus' side. And when he did so, we see the manifestation of faith there. But also notice what was said. Blessed are those who don't see, but still believe. You see, we don't need to have the physical. Faith is not seeing something, but still being confident that it's there and holding to it. They had been given these great and precious promises, and yet they turned the back on it. Here he was drawing a conclusion by comparing the political and religious leaders of Jerusalem to those who had caused the fall of the northern kingdom. Sit up. Pay attention. Don't you know what happened to Israel? That's the point. And Isaiah addressed these leaders as scoffers. Now, the term in Hebrew is the strongest negative term in the Old Testament to describe wicked men. They were the worst, is how they're portrayed. The scoffer can be defined as one who is insolent, who is contemptuous, who is arrogant, and one who turns his back on what is good. The scoffer is often condemned in the book of Proverbs. Powerful study there. So not only did these rulers choose to go the wrong way, but they mocked what was right. It's one thing to go a different way. It's another way to make fun of God's way. And that's what, in essence, they were doing in their leadership capacity. They delighted in misleading people. How horrible a situation. And folks, we see the same thing going on today. I have Zero respect for a man that knows that he's teaching error. And yet he does so, and he delights in doing so. And we see that throughout the religious world today. I won't mention names at this point. You know who I'm talking about. We see them on the television all the time. But then verse 15, and here's where we'll close as we're out of time. The result of Israel's foreign policy is depicted here. Their foreign policy was not trust in God. Their foreign policy was trust in these physical kingdoms. And therefore, it was based on falsehood. It was based on deception. The covenant with Egypt would not protect them. It's doomed to failure. Thank you again for your interest in the study of the book of Isaiah. We'll pick up here and we're going to see again a great prophecy made about the cornerstone. And that's where we'll start next time. Until then, God bless you.